if you didn't have any clouds at all, the Earth would be much hotter than it is now. And it wouldn't matter how much CO2 we put into it, it would, it would be negligible. The, the effect of CO2 mm. would be negligible compared to the lack of clouds. Yeah. What's up, you scholars of enlightenment? Welcome back to the channel. So today, an interview for you with Dr. Hamish Gordon. Hamish is a former colleague of mine from the LHC B experiment, the Large Hadron Collider Beauty Experiment at CERN. And now he's a doctor at Leeds University where he studies um, aerosol cloud radiation interactions, cloud formation, and most importantly, climate change. So in this era where I've constantly got Greta Thunberg all over my social media profiles, we've got Extinction Rebellion running around London, we've got the Green New Deal in America, we've got the global climate strike. I thought it'd be a good time, it's always a good time, but a great time to catch up with my former colleagues. So in case you didn't know, and I didn't know before this interview, clouds can have a dramatic impact on the global climate here on Earth by reflecting solar energy back towards the sun and therefore cooling the earth down. But the chemical mechanisms behind the formations of clouds have historically not been very well understood. And, and that lack of knowledge has led to um, vast errors or at least vast um, widths of estimates in climate models and uncertainties in climate models going forwards, which are obviously very important um, at the moment, as we assess policy and we think about the politics that we'll need going forwards to deal with man-made climate change. So I thought it'd be a good time to catch up with Hamish and we discuss the state of the art when we're dealing with cloud formation. I hope you enjoy. So you've done a lot of work on how clouds, clouds form and especially the, the chemicals and the particles known as aerosols um, that seed cloud formation. So can you tell us a bit about that? How is it that clouds form and how do they depend on these these particles, which people might not be too aware of. Okay, so a, a cloud doesn't just need moisture in the atmosphere in order to, to start, in order to, to condense water from the gas phase to the, the liquid phase. You need something, a surface, for the water molecules to stick to. Um, so like a nucleus, like a bit exactly. for it to form around. Exactly. So if you didn't have any aerosols, then eventually you'd get the, the, the clouds would form on gas molecules. But at the, in the atmosphere as it is now, we have so much pollution. And indeed, even before humans started polluting the atmosphere, there were, there were enormous numbers of natural particles around. So there's always been enough aerosol particles to act as surfaces for cloud droplets to form on. So in the atmosphere, air parcels or, or sort of lumps of air if you like they, they move upwards and as they rise that the then they cool down because the temperature gets colder as you go up and consequently if there's then aerosol particles in that lump of air yeah then and it's rising then you'll get the cloud to form in in that air mass so these aerosol particles come from things like like smoke like pollution and also from natural Natural particles from things like trees put out by um, naturally from the environment. Yeah, that's right. So in you can we usually classify the particles into two types. There's the primary ones which are emitted directly from the ground. So for example, soot coming from coal power stations or yep. car exhausts or whatever, or smoke. Um, also sea salt particles. So the wind uh, is a big the wind whipping the tops of waves on the ocean is a big source really? of aerosol because the sea spray, so say so sea spray comes off the waves and then the water evaporates and you're left yep. with salt. And that, that's a big, that's, I think, the, the greatest overall mass of aerosol in the atmosphere is either sea salt or dust. Yeah. So th these are all primary particles, dust, yep. sea salt, soot. Yeah. Another kind of particles, which is about... I, we calculated about half the total number of cloud-forming particles are formed when gas molecules stick together. 
So instead of having particles emitted directly from the ground, you've got gas molecules emitted from the ground, and then the gas molecules stick together until, okay. until you make a particle. Um, and it's actually those particles that I've spent most time thinking about. Mm. So, so in many ways, we actually sort of owe our existence here on the Earth to these aerosols, even though we might not be aware of them, because I guess without them, there wouldn't be any rain, the temperature would be much hotter, they're actually far more important than people potentially realise. So if we didn't have any aerosols, then cloud droplets would start forming eventually around ions from cosmic rays yeah. or around gas molecules. Um, but the supersaturation of water, so the, the, the amount of moisture needed to form a cloud droplet would be much higher than the amount of moisture needed to form a cloud droplet on an aerosol particle. Um, so we have a drier, much drier climate, potentially. Well, I guess the clouds would probably be higher mm. um, because it would, you'd need more cooling to generate the moisture mm. or the, the, the yeah, to, to get enough relative humidity to form the, um, the clouds. The, I don't, off the top of my head, know what happened would happen to rain. Uh, <laughs> it's an interesting question. But it would be, yeah. But without these aerosols, potentially there could be huge impacts on the on the way the climate would operate. Potentially not good. Absolutely um, for us. Absolutely, yeah. So I guess the idea is that obviously these aerosols um, have a have a great impact on seeding clouds, and that means, although people not, might not realise, clouds can have a great impact on. The global temperature so the idea is that if we have more aerosols in the atmosphere more cloud formation um, these clouds can reflect more of the sun's energy back into space um, so they actually have clouds a great impact on the global climate potentially that's right so the cloud the reflectivity of a cloud depends on how thick it is how, mu how much water there is in the cloud yeah and on how many aerosols there are in the cloud. Because if there are more aerosols in the cloud, you'll get more droplets for the same amount of water oh, okay. vapor. So the droplets will be smaller, and it's a, a property of, of, of optical scattering, if you like, that smaller droplets are better at reflecting radiation mm. than, or overall, a cloud with small droplets in it will be more reflective than a cloud with a fewer yeah. big droplets in it. Yeah. So the, if you increase the number of particles, the, um, the, the, the reflectivity of the cloud will increase and the amount of energy reflected back to the sun will increase. And this leads to a significant cooling of climate. So, I mean, if you didn't have any clouds at all, the Earth would be much hotter than it is now. And it wouldn't matter how much CO two we put into it; it would it would be neg the the effect of CO two would be negligible compared to the lack of clouds. Yeah. But at the moment, um, if given that we have a lot of cloud, we calculate or we estimate that since the industrial revolution, um, the effect of air pollution has offset, to some extent, the effect of increased CO2. Yeah. So putting more particles into the atmosphere has caused a cooling which is about half as, or a th between a quarter and a half as strong yeah. as the warming that we've created by putting CO2 into the atmosphere. Yes. So the burning of coal, for example, great uh, increase in the amount of um, greenhouse gases, which obviously warms the planet, but putting more aerosols into the atmosphere has created more clouds, which has had an effect in the opposite direction, which might have helped us to some extent. Absolutely. And as we reduce air pollution uh, to stop people dying of air pollution and uh, respiratory problems, we can expect the rate of global temperature rise to increase. Oh, very interesting. So there's because, competing... Well, there's competing because this, this offsetting cooling is going to become less strong yeah. uh, as, we, as we clean up the atmosphere. And, I mean, if, you know, we have to bear in mind then that, that global warming might be worse than we would calculate if we ignored the effect of aerosols. Very interesting. Is there anything we can do in a 
in a, in a sort of manual sense, in a, in a synthetic sense, to replace those aerosols with with something synthetic that could do a similar job, but perhaps not be as harmful to human health, or is that not something that's being considered? Just off the top of my head, thinking. So that's a uh, this is this suggestion is known as geoengineering, okay. and there, damn, I didn't come up with something <laughs> something new and interesting for uh, for the community. But. So the there are several schemes which involve aerosols, which have been suggested. One is to inject sulfur aerosols into the stratosphere, where they would be so high that they wouldn't hurt anyone, but they would still cool the climate. Actually, not by influencing clouds so much as by reflecting radiation directly. Directly, okay. So the, the, if you put enough aerosols in, they have a, they have a significant effect yeah. um, just by themselves without seeding cloud droplets. Um, if... Another possibility has been suggested is to in, to increase the volume of sea spray injected. So you have ships um, basically vaporizing water from the sea um, and, and in, enhancing the effect of the wind in generating sea spray aerosol. And this would increase the, or at least the idea is to increase the the, the, the scattering from boundary layer or low, low level clouds. Now this is, this is an interesting suggestion because this is directly using the same aerosol cloud interaction uh, hypothesis to, to cool the climate. Yeah. However, it proves to be very difficult when you do the calculations because um, aerosols make clouds more reflective but they also change the properties of the cloud in the sense that they can increase or decrease the probability of raining Um, and if the aerosols make rain more likely as in fact large sea spray particles probably do because well the 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 technical name for these is giant cloud condensation nuclei which and one of these things can make a raindrop effectively so there's this this idea that 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 these these big sea spray particles might actually produce rain and of course if they produce rain then the cloud the cloud rains out and disappears and you don't get the cooling effect yeah so you don't want that so this this idea of so you want you want large puffy reflective clouds that hang around for a, as long a period as possible without raining out would absolutely be, would be the, i mean the best type of the best type of clouds are, are would actually be the the layers yeah because those you know you don't you, you get a complete sheet yeah um and, it, and it's white and compared to the ocean which is dark yeah uh and and indeed most of most of us start thinking about um clouds mostly over the ocean because it's over the ocean where the effect on climate is much stronger than over land, because okay. just because the ocean's darker than the land surface. Because, so the, clouds because men, the, the coefficient of um, heat retention of the water is much higher than the land. Is that is that why, or is that? No, it's just that the ocean's dark okay. and the land is white. Okay. The, land oh, okay. is, the land is green. So the absorption or grey right. or yellow, and the ocean is dark blue. Um, so yeah, the I mean. You could put it into, and, and therefore, you know, your your shortwave reflectivity is, is is much lower from the ocean than it is from the land. Oh, interesting. Um, the other thing is that clouds over land are more difficult to simulate because the land is not a flat surface, and therefore, you get clouds forming around mountains. Yes, and so the the relief rain and the, exactly. these types of things. And this is this is difficult in a low resolution climate model where you don't. You you have like you, you simulate the Earth as a series of these big big boxes, and each box yeah. might have a mountain in it. Yeah. And if a box has a mountain in it, you're not going to resolve the, the 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 properties correctly. Understood. So this is um, really interesting, actually, because I didn't realise that understanding how clouds form was one of the major um, stumbling blocks, one of the major problems in making accurate climate models going forwards and in making predictions about how the temperature will raise um, going forward. So obviously there's been a lot of focus on this recently. Uh, we've had the IPCC report, which suggested, I think, 
Uh, let me find it, 1.5 to 4.5 degrees C for a doubling in carbon dioxide by 2050, potentially. Yes. Um, we've had the Green New Deal to great fanfare in America. We've had the global climate strike, of which a lot of the Leeds University students were dancing around outside the town hall. They were. Uh, so I can... I can. But the largest uncertainty is actually in understanding this, this microphysics of how clouds form. Yes. So the difference between 1.5 degrees and 4.5 degrees mm. is very large. And this uncertainty has not decreased in substantially, at least, in the last 30 years. Yeah. Um, and, and this is problematic for policy because yes. people look at it and they think, oh, well, we can deal with 1.5 we yeah, can't yeah. deal with 4.5, but if your errors are so big, people go, nah, I'm not, not and, really interested. So it's important to get that, that so, error bar down. Yeah, exactly. And so this uncertainty is due to two major factors. There's the uncertainty in the uh, energy imbalance between energy coming in and energy going out of the Earth. And this is, this is called the radiative forcing uncertainty. And this uncertainty is driven by primarily by the uncertainty in aerosol cloud interactions yeah. that we've just been discussing. Yeah. The other large uncertainty which drives this un, this this one point five to four point five range is the uncertainty in climate feedbacks. So this uncertainty is basically the, the well the dominant the dominant source of uncertainty in the feedback term is then how clouds respond to warming temperatures. Interesting. So, you so, so it's, not, these... it's not a continuous process. The clouds will change how they operate as the temperature goes forward. Absolutely. So, so there's, a, there's a feedback mechanism there, as you say. Absolutely. And so we know relatively well that the effect of CO2 on forcing, so we know the energy imbalance caused by CO2. What we don't know is the energy imbalance caused by aerosols. Yes. So, that's the, so aerosols and clouds are key to the forcing uncertainty. Yeah. Then we know that for the feedbacks, we know that as the temperature rises, there'll be more water vapour evaporating from the ocean. Sure. And water vapour is itself a greenhouse gas. So every, every unit of CO2 we put into the air is going to cause slightly more warming yeah. because of the water vapour as well as the CO2. But that's relatively well understood. What is not well understood is how that increased water vapour and the increased temperatures will conspire to make more clouds yes. or less clouds. And therefore, whether there is a positive or a negative feedback of clouds to climate warming... And um, this is this is actually a question which I haven't thought um, I, it is beyond my expertise at the moment, but it's something I'm interested to study more in future. Yeah. So in the um, climate models that we have, an interesting thing is is trying to get these aerosol cloud interactions actually in a um, in a controlled environment, in a laboratory environment, understand how clouds form in a laboratory environment. Um, so we have. The temperature change from pre-industrial era to now we have roughly from our best estimates in ice cores the aerosol levels from then to now and we know how cloudy the atmosphere is now so really one of the things you do i guess is trying to work out how cloudy it was in the pre-industrial era and then we can understand how that temperature increase from pre-industrial to now impacts on or is, is impacted by that relative cloudiness between yeah. the periods because nobody was sat there in 1750 going, mm, five absolutely clouds right. today, six clouds today. So, yes, absolutely right. I mean, we, we measure clouds today using satellites. Yeah. And of course, there were no satellites before about, well, no, no satellites measuring clouds before the 1970s or 1980s. Ice cores are a good... Uh, metric or a, a good source of information about pre-industrial aerosols. However, it's horrifically uncertain. Yeah. So we. So it's have, the best we've got, but it's still pretty. Yes. Pretty bad. We really don't know. I mean, so so one. Let, let's take take the different sources of aerosol. We have we know that there are factories emitting aerosol now that were not there in the pre-industrial time. Sure. So that's relatively straightforward, provided we know how much aerosol they emit now. Sure. Which is not necessarily always easy, but it, it, we have a handle on it. 
The, but at least they're there yeah. for us to go and make measurements. And then on. we know how much natural aerosol is emitted because we know that certain um, certain bacteria in the ocean emit aerosols. Yeah. Certain tr- trees emit gases which make aerosols, etc., etc. What we really struggle with is the uncertainty on how many fires there were in the pre-industrial time. Okay. How many wildfires there were in the pre-industrial is a huge source of uncertainty because wildfires are a huge source of aerosols and they're a big source of aerosols in parts of the atmosphere where these aerosols matter most. Interesting. So the world's biggest source of biomass burning aerosol is in Central Africa. And I believe this is something you do. This is something we can, we can come back to perhaps. Yeah. And so, and the, these aerosols blow over the ocean and then they affect the clouds and they affect the reflectivity mm. of the ocean. So the... Understanding how many fires there were in the pre-industrial atmosphere is something we, we, we have very little idea about because we've cut the land surface up with roads and railways mm. and stuff. We've stopped a lot of fires. Yeah. But we also have increased temperatures, which have increased the rate of fire. Yeah. So it's actually really not clear whether there were more fires in the pre-industrial than there are now or fewer. Yeah. And... You know, so we're heaping, heaping uncertainties on top of uncertainties. Absolutely right. It's a huge, it's a huge problem, and then there are other huge problems with other types of aerosol as well. I mean, we can. The volcanoes are a big source of aerosol, but of course we don't have a record of volcanic eruptions going back indefinitely. Sure. Um, so we don't know how many. I mean, we we know that we volcanoes are a fantastic experiment though, because when there is a volcanic eruption you get a, um, a a huge source of aerosol yeah. in a place where there was probably relatively little aerosol before, yeah. and you can test what happens to the clouds. Yeah. And so you, lots of researchers I know are looking, looking for volcanoes, um, and when there's an eruption, you know, they'll, be, they'll be trying to send planes up there to see what, what the aerosol concentration is and all of this kind of thing. So understanding how all these things have changed and the record of those in time between pre-industrial and now is... They all are uncertainties that go into the model, which are very difficult yes. to deal with because we don't have that formula. Absolutely, model. and and a huge huge element of the aerosol research we do in Leeds University is understanding these uncertainties better. Yeah. By and the way we do this is by changing parameters in the model. So, for example, the 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 rate of emission of sulfur from volcanoes, or the the. Um, rate of rain formation from clouds with a certain aerosol concentration, changing these parameters in the model, running many, many different simulations, and then um, Trying to amalgamating the these together one, and, yeah. and understanding the distribution of uncertainty. Yeah. Yeah. From, from, and the model we use for this is the Met Office climate model. And this is actually a different approach to the approach taken by the IPCC when they get their change from 1.5 to 4 or their range from 1.5 to 4.5 degrees what they do to get that range is actually to compare lots of different climate models okay so both so you run the same one with different tunings exactly. of parameters whereas they take different models which have a particular set tuning based on best estimates but then they exactly amalgamate all of those models together exactly right interesting and both approaches have different advantages and disadvantages so different models have different um structure sure. and our model you know if our model has a has a bug in it or a or a, a represents a process badly yes then that will affect all of these perturbed parameters yeah whereas in the ipcc ensemble they're not dependent on yeah. any particular model yeah. on the other hand all the models in the IPCC uh, collection do roughly the same, have take roughly the same approach yeah. for quite a lot of the processes in them, and there might be lots of different approaches which would give different yeah. answers. Yeah. So these models are all quite the the answers these models give are quite correlated. Yeah. And to any statistician, that that raises a bit of a red flag. Yeah. So. You know, there are advantages and disadvantages to both approaches and, and we do the best we can. And we, indeed, we hope that the IPCC will, in the next iteration, it will try to incorporate more of the kind of approaches we've been de- adopting in Leeds as well as it's yeah. in, in tandem and together with this already valuable approach of combining the different models. Yes. 
So we now have um, an actual way to study aerosols and cloud formation under laboratory conditions, which is the cloud experiment on which you have worked. Um, tell us a little bit about that and how it works. So it's a big steel sure. container at CERN Absolutely. where we can actually make clouds and understand how they, how they are formed. So yes, there, we have a big steel chamber in CERN. Um, it's, the volume is 27 cubic meters, so it is, it's you know, two stories high or whatever. And the most important attributes of the chamber are the cleanliness of it and the careful control of the temperature. So the main focus of the chamber experiments up till now has been on making aerosol particles. It can also make clouds. And we have done it, and we've published some useful papers on the subject. But it's not been the main thrust of our work. So you're actually dealing more with the aerosols directly rather than creating clouds in the chamber. That's right. That's right. We we have the capability to create clouds, but we we're looking when we're looking at this aerosol formation. This is the second category of aerosols which are formed by gas molecules sticking together rather than by. So you weren't pumping smoke in and exactly sort of we. Stuff. We don't pump that kind of thing in because we want to keep the chamber as clean as possible. And so when gas molecules stick together, they, they, you have to get a lot of molecules to stick together to make a particle big enough to seed cloud droplets. Yeah. So one molecule is about one nanometer. Well, it's a bit less than one nanometer in diameter usually. And to seed a cloud droplet, you need something like 50, usually you need, a, it depends on the cloud, but usually you need about 50 or 100 nanometer particle. So, you know, it's 50 cubed or something. It's a yeah. big number. Yeah. So what this means is that um, the, uh, well, the, the, the particle formation is a, as a nonlinear process. And if you, um, so, so you, that's partly why you need a big chamber because these gas molecules stick to the walls of the chamber yeah. and you don't really want that because you're trying to simulate the atmosphere and the atmosphere doesn't, doesn't have walls. huge steel walls on yeah, exactly. Area. So that's why you need a big chamber and then you need it to be super clean because there are quite a lot of different gas molecules that can make particles and you only want the ones that you put into the chamber to, study, to be making to, yeah. the particles. Yeah. Um, so what this thing is, and then the other thing is that the rate at which the particles form is very sensitive to temperature because the way the process works is that the particles hit each other and there's a probability with which they stick together. So, but once they've stuck, they, a lot of the time, they just evaporate again. Yeah. And the reason they evaporate is because they have thermal energy. Sure. So if it's warmer, then this particle formation process is less effective. So it's, it's one of these, um, thinking back to my chemistry in A-level, it's one of these reversible reactions where yeah. they're sticking together, but they're also falling apart. Yeah. And it's what's the net rate of sticking rather than absolutely apart. And, you know, one, one sticking event in 100 or whatever is going to result in, a, in growth to a, 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 a sizable part of mm. um, so what? So you have to have a uh, very clean chamber, very big chamber, yeah. and also strong um, temperature control of the of the chamber yeah or know what the temperature is and also know exactly what you're pumping in at the bottom of the chamber the particular particles that you want to um, study the chemistry of and how they go towards making aerosol particles yes absolutely so so the usual procedure is that we'll mix a set of gases inside the chamber and examine slowly the concentration of particles that we form so we put in some gases like sulfur dioxide and we can actually do chemical reactions inside the chamber as well. So we put in sulfur dioxide and ozone, the ozone reacts to make hydroxyl OH and then the OH reacts with SO2 and the, the end product is sulfuric acid ah, okay. and sulfuric acid is very effective at making particles, especially when you also have ammonia or amines, which are molecules which are emitted by um, agricultural activity. So actually cows belching um, uh, and also decomposing vegetation of one sort or another. The cows are always important. Um, they're, they're fighting out one end, but they're belching yep. out something that helps us on the other. So yeah, yeah. cows, pros so, and cons. So, so yeah, the, so, so we've got these mix of gases in the chamber. And the next 
once we've done that, the reason the experiment was started was to investigate whether ions from cosmic rays can substantially influence particle formation. Ah, this is this is what was interesting. So the question came, why is this huge experiment on clouds at CERN? Why is it at the Large Hadron Collider? And this is the this yeah. is the point that another factor of this is firing these high energy beams of particles at this chamber. Absolutely right. So the in the atmosphere you've got cosmic rays which have very high energy usually but they're relatively low intensity um, and they are more intense at the top of the atmosphere or you know 15 kilometers altitude than they are in at the surface so if we do an experiment in conditions in the chamber we only ever get the cosmic rays that are typical of the cosmic ray intensity at the surface yes so in order to increase the cosmic ray intensity to the intensity typical of the upper atmosphere, we use one of the CERN accelerators, and this is why the experiments at CERN. Yeah. So the CERN accelerator emits particles, uh, well, it generate, well, you've got these particles which originally come from a hydrogen bottle. They're accelerated through the CERN complex, they hit a target, well, these protons hit a target, they generate pions, and the pions are irradiating the chamber. Yeah. So in the experimental hall or warehouse in which this thing is sitting, you've got at one side of a sort of room in the warehouse, you've got the chamber yeah. and at the other end, you've got a magnet and a pipe and the particles are coming out of yeah. this pipe. They're, 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 the beam of particles is reverse focused, if you like, by the magnet. Yeah. So it's opposite to most of the magnets. Yes. So, so it's spread out it's into spread a sort of diverse cloud it over the yeah. spreads over the chamber. Yeah. And it generates cosmic it generates effective cosmic ray intensity typical yeah. of the upper atmosphere. Yeah. Um, the other thing we can do to test the effect of ions on particle formation is we can switch all of, we can switch the cosmic rays off. We can't, of course, switch off the source of cosmic rays from outer space, but what we can do is we can put we can generate an electric field within the chamber. And this electric field, um, we, we apply something like 30 kilovolts from one plate to the other. And the when the when the cosmic rays enter the chamber, they generate ions, but the ions are immediately sucked to one or the other, uh, electrode okay. by the electric field. So, so, so therefore, we can have a particles. we can have a control situation where we exactly take, where we take uh, cosmic rays out of the equation, and therefore, the difference between those two scenarios, we can assess how cosmic rays impact the rate of cloud formation. Exactly right. Yeah. So we have this control control experiment as well, but with the electric field. Very interesting. And so the results of the experiment have been that. Cosmic rays are important. They cause a big percentage of the particle formation that happens in the atmosphere. However, small changes in cosmic ray intensity don't lead to big changes in the number of cloud seeding particles. Okay. So one of the hypotheses that was put about in the early 2000s or late 1990s was that... Um, this was Mr. Svensmark. Uh, he, he, he's been making hypotheses which have overstated the importance of cosmic rays on climate. I think, I think what he was saying is that the, the magnetic activity of the sun changes on this, yeah. on this sort of regular cycle... Um, and we can measure that with things like the number of sunspots and things like this. Yeah. Um, and that when the sun is at its peak of magnetic intensity, it envelops the Earth and it, and it pushes away, much like it does in the cloud experiment, this electric field, pushes away those cosmic rays, lowers that rate of cosmic ray. In between those periods, when the, the sun is weak in terms of its magnetism, it doesn't do that and we get more cosmic rays, therefore more clouds. And therefore his hypothesis was that the amount of clouds that are produced on the Earth are entirely controlled by the amount of cosmic rays coming from outer space and strongly modulated by the mag magnetism of the sun. And therefore, climate change is basically only due to natural phenomena, the cosmic ray intensity and the, and the sun. So there's, yeah, I mean, there's a definite, there's certainly a correlation between the number of sunspots and the cosmic ray intensity. The 
11 year cycle is only one of the variations in the cosmic ray intensity. So the cosmic ray intensity has changed over between about 1500 or 1600 AD and the present day. And so back there was a so-called, and, and indeed the climate has also changed. There was this so-called medieval warm period, yes. followed by the Little Ice Age, followed by the, um, the present day Anthropocene, as it is so called. Now, and he seemed to want to link that to things like the Earth going through a spiral arm of the galaxy and getting more cosmic rays and these kind of things. And as you say, he, well, he showed some really beautiful correlations, but it seems that the causation isn't, isn't quite that. Well, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to try to argue with his astrophysics. <laughs> I mean, the, the cosmic ray intensity, the reasons for the change in cosmic ray intensity, I, 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 I'm ignorant of. But the, the, there is a, a difference, so the, there is a definite difference between the number of cosmic rays in the pre-industrial period and the number of cosmic rays in the present day. However, that difference is of order 30% or less in the cosmic ray intensity. And pretty much, well, the scientific consensus, myself, my studies included, have shown that the 30% change in the cosmic ray intensity leads to, at best, a less than 1% yeah, ch yeah. change in yeah. the number of cloud seeding particles. So, so he seems to have a lot of nice correlations, but not necessarily the yeah. causation under laboratory conditions with cloud. There is no evidence that changes in the cosmic ray intensity significantly affect the present day climate. Understood. It is possible that much larger changes in cosmic ray intensity very far back in the paleoclimate era millions of years ago um, may, may have, have a made bigger a bigger impact. difference yeah. because then then not only were there much bigger changes in the cosmic ray intensity but the atmosphere was also cleaner probably I mean, unless there were huge numbers of volcanoes or fires <laughs> or whatever. But the atmosphere was probably cleaner back then than it is now. Yeah. And one reason, why, um, one reason why you'd expect effects to be smaller today than they were in, in the paleoclimatic period is because the, um, chain, the number of particles which are formed by gas-to-particle conversion, the number of particles which are formed by these gas molecules sticking together is relatively speaking smaller now than it would be if the atmosphere was cleaner yeah. because we've um we we've emit we're emitting fossil fuel particles soot etc into the atmosphere and what happens is that gas molecules stick to those existing soot particles instead of forming new particles by themselves mm -hmm. and this leads to a big negative feedback so if you increase the number of primary particles, you substantially decrease the amount of newly formed particles uh, in the atmosphere. So that reduces the possible effects of cosmic rays on the present day climate. Yeah. But indeed, this is actually, I mean, even, if, even in the pre-industrial atmosphere, if my simulations and other people's have shown that the variations in cosmic rays over the 10-year solar cycle and the variations over the few hundred years of the industrial period are nowhere near big enough yeah, yeah. to substantially affect global particle concentrations. Yeah. And even if they did affect global particle concentrations, there's then another big step to before yeah. you can say they strongly affect global temperature. Yes, yes. So there's, a, there's some impressive correlations here but it yeah. looks like there isn't, well, there definitely isn't a, a proven causation under laboratory conditions. And, and this is where the problem comes for people who want to say that climate change is just um, a natural phenomenon. It seems that all of the models that we have suggest that is very much not the case. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it was argued in the late 90s that mechanisms like this cosmic ray climate hypothesis, also the variations in the Earth's orbit around the sun, yes. all of this kind of thing could have led to temperature rises which were similar to the temperature rise observed due to CO2 emissions. Yeah. And I think it's been 
comprehensively demonstrated in the last 20 years that this is not true. It's not the case, yeah. So that's a very good rundown of, of how we, how cloud has shown how cosmic rays impact on uh, cloud formation. In terms of the microphysics of, and the vapours that lead to making aerosols, one of the big findings was that a huge part of that is biogenic vapours from trees and therefore that the pre-industrial era might have been cloudier than we actually thought it was initially. So that's an interesting point. So, so in, the, in climate models until very recently, in fact in, in almost all current climate models, particle formation is assumed to only exist where there is sulfuric acid. So the, this is fine in most areas of the atmosphere because um, sulfuric acid is indeed probably the most important okay. source of particles. However, it's also true that in, in some circumstances, biogenic vapours from trees can make particles as well. So sulfuric acid is not uniquely able to make particles. And so the, so the, uh, the classic example of this um, from my guerrilla research was the blue haze that you see on distant mountains is actually the aerosols and the, and yes. the mist that's formed around those aerosol particles is biogenic vapours from the trees on, on those mountains. Yes, you have to be careful when you look at the atmosphere because it's very difficult to exclude the role of sure, sulfuric sure, acid sure, in, sure. in these things. But there's always some sulfuric exactly, acid. Yeah. But for example, over the Amazon rainforest, there is very little sulfuric acid. There is also very little particle formation, but occasionally it does happen. Yeah. And similarly, in very pristine areas in northern Canada or Siberia, again, you, you, you don't see very, many, very much particle formation. But where, where it does happen, it may well not be due to sulfuric acid. It may be these biogenic vapours from trees. Now, the important point here is that most sulfuric acid emissions are due to uh, human activity. Now, that's not the same as saying most of the, the majority of the sulfuric acid concentration is due to human activity. So concentrations of sulfuric acid today are probably a factor of two at most higher than they were in the pre-industrial period because there were many natural sources of sulfuric acid. So there are plankton in the ocean which emit dimethyl sulfide and this reacts to make sulfuric acid. These, these kind of similar bacteria exist on land as well. Volcanoes emit sulfur dioxide. Mm. You've got quite a lot of na natural sources of sulfuric acid as well. However, it's definitely the case that sulfuric acid concentrations are higher now than they were before. And therefore, we can speculate, we can't be sure, but we can speculate that biogenic vapours in the pre-industrial atmosphere may have been more important yeah. than they were now. And the mechanism for forming particles from biogenic vapours is missing from almost all climate models. Ah, interesting. And so this is, this is one of the important results that the, from the cloud experiment in the last th four years was to quantify at least in a specific set of conditions, the rate of formation of these, these, biogen these biogenic particles. Now, unfortunately, it's, it's, we really need to, cons to, to, calculate, to simulate in the cloud chamber every possible set of atmospheric yeah. conditions because yeah. there's very complicated chemistry going on yeah. which can substantially change the formation rate. Yeah. So it's still very uncertain how, mu how important this pure biogenic process is. However, it might be important, and we calculated in a paper I published in 2016 that it could lead to a significant effect on climate, yeah. in, or in, on climate forcing at least, if we um, took the cloud result, take the cloud results at face value and assume that other gases aren't interfering with the process yes. and all that. But in that study, we also found that the model predicted too much particle formation in the Amazon and in okay. Canada and so on. Okay. So it's not perfect, it was, but it could have an effect. It's not perfect, but it could, be, it could have an effect. It could Absolutely. potentially be... So getting rid of huge swathes of the Amazon could have a twofold effect. One, yes. you're not taking as much CO2 out of the atmosphere through those trees photosynthesis, and also you're not producing as many biogenic particles Absolutely. to see as many clouds. Hamish, that was really fascinating. I never knew that clouds were so interesting, so important for the climate. 
and so important for us going forward as a species. Thank you very much for talking to us um, today. Um, let's call it a day and let's have a beer. Yep, sounds good.